in to the Chris Collinsworth podcast. And uh, as we roll out our NBA version of this one, we've got the tallest guys in the company. And that's not true. We don't have Palazzolo. We don't at 6'10". That would be, he would be the leader in the clubhouse. Eric Eager on the program today, ahead of our uh, R&D department, uh, coming in at a measly 6'3", and, uh, but is the only guy that could probably, out of the trio, still dunk a basketball. I don't know, Brad, maybe you'll have to correct me on that one. And Brad Spielberger, who is our uh, all things expert, but in particular, uh, he is our capologist and uh, mathematician in many ways here. How are you guys? I, I'm doing really well. I think uh, this past weekend, we paid our dues uh, and watching some kind of, you know, doozy games just so that we can get uh, four games with really good teams this week. So a lot of people looked at last week and were like, uh, oh, the, the games kind of sucked. And I'm like, yeah, but uh, wouldn't wouldn't you rather I mean, wouldn't you rather have, you know, the games that we have this weekend than have, let's say, you know, uh, Pittsburgh versus Tennessee or something like that. So uh, I, I think we're I think we're in a good spot this week. Yeah, I love some of the uh, rematches too. Obviously, Bills Chiefs and, and your Rams Bucks games should be some. You know, it was so long ago that they played, so I think you know some new looks and and they both evolved as the season have gone on. So it should be interesting. Uh, it's on our game in particular. I went back and watched the original tape, and I go, "This is a waste of time. It's not even the same team." You know, the receivers in particular aren't even close to what they were at that time when you start bringing in Odell Beckham Jr. and there's no Robert Woods and there's no Deshaun Jackson. And, you know, now Antonio Brown is not a, a, a part of the mix. Chris Godwin out of there. So it's it's really two completely uh, different teams. But I, I tell you, I love this game. And I know we got a million things to to get into. But when you start talking about Leonard Floyd and Aaron Donald and Von Miller, and uh, Jalen Ramsey taking out Mike Evans and the possibilities of these guys getting after Tom Brady with a banged up offensive line. You know, we don't know. Is Tristan Wirfs going to play? I don't know. To Ryan Jensen, he finished the game the other day. But it is going to be a very intriguing game to see. Can Tom Brady, who is the best pass rushing protector of a quarterback I've ever seen. I mean, this guy does more to protect himself than anybody in the history of the game, maybe Peyton Manning on that list as well. Uh, but can he protect himself here by getting it out quick, staying with that no huddle, wearing down those pass rushers? Because if he can't, and he sees what we saw in the first half against uh, the Arizona Cardinals, uh, it's going to be a long, painful night for Tom Brady. So this is, this is some matchup. It really is, especially... And we'll see how it plays out. Does Jalen Ramsey just take Mike Evans all over the field? Uh, and then then where are you going? You know, Scotty Miller, Tyler Johnson, Gronk, you know, where are you going on, on the outside? So uh, a lot of really intriguing things. Two great defenses going at it in this one. And the Rams did get them, though. They got them pretty easily uh, the first go around. Uh, but also in that game, Deshaun Jackson went off you know and he's not there anyway so i mean the whole thing's just kind of uh it's going to be crazy but it's going to be really fun do you guys have a particular game you're looking forward to well i think this one is the is the one right where you know I, the one after it obviously buffalo kansas city is is, a, is going to be amazing i think that team probably represents the afc in the super bowl whoever wins that one um but this one you know it, it is the confluence of things you said i think you you were the one who said it best? He was, you know, a year ago when they drafted Trist Tristan Wirfs. It's like, you know, Tristan Wirfs is going to have a lot of success because he's protected by Tom Brady. Tom Brady protects his offensive line a lot more than the other way around. And I think, you know, part of me is saying, okay, with a week week to prepare for this, and I, it doesn't matter if Wirfs Wirf or Jensen plays so much as Brady knows that whomever is playing in those positions, it's going to be weaker than normal during the middle of a game. It's harder to adjust your game plan and stuff. Like I remember you know, going back to even Brady's Patriot days were like in their 17 and 0 season, like they played the chargers, I think in the divisional round of the AFC title and they played a lot of three tight ends. Right. And they played, you know, they, they do kind of some of these things that they can match up. And I do think you're going to see a lot more of like Cameron Brate and OJ Howard in this game uh, to sort of abate some of those things. But one major thing that's, that's crucial about this game, the Rams, we, we chart one of these things called middle of the field, open and close. And whether you play it pre-snap or post-snap, the Rams 
change the middle of the field, pre-snap and post-snap, 45% of the time. And that's nine percentage points more than any other team in the NFL. Raheem Morris, that's the one thing he's taken from Brandon Staley and pushed uh, even further in another direction. Tom Brady this season is the is the highest graded quarterback in the NFL. He has 35 touchdowns to just uh, seven interceptions and is the highest graded quarterback. When the other team plays the same coverage, they show. When the team changes the coverage, he's the ninth greatest, highest graded quarterback in the league. And he's basically got the same yards per attempt and completion percentage. But he has just eight touchdowns, five interceptions, kind of a similar big time throw turnover with the play split when, uh, you know, the team disguises coverage. It'll be, it, to me, the question becomes, can Brady maneuver the offensive line at the same time that he also takes into consideration the coverage changes? And will his younger receivers uh, be able to change their their assignments on the fly the way that maybe some of his veteran guys could. You know, but it, the flip side of interesting on that is that, okay, you've got Nick Scott, who's been their special teams guy, playing one safety position right. potentially, depending on Taylor Rapp and Jordan Fuller, how healthy they are. And Eric Weddle got called off the beach a week ago, and he was playing a lot of right. snaps back there. Now, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever personally dealt with. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, but so it, it, how how expansive can the Rams be uh, with those disguises when they're trying to work those guys in there as well? Brad, how about you? What do you like? Yeah, you know, I think with this matchup, you mentioned it, it was a long time ago, but Brady threw the ball 55 times in this first matchup. And that's just not a sustainable strategy probably against this Rams defense, especially, you know, Von Miller was not a Ram at the time. Uh, and, and I think this game for me, I think Gio Bernard is a, is a huge piece of this game on offense for the Buccaneers. You know, I think you can take advantage of Troy Reader. You know, they're all fall linebacker for the Rams and, and, and get Bernard out in space and, and maybe get some yards after the catch. And of course, playoff Lenny on his way back needs to have a big game. Um, I think it's going to look completely different than the first matchup. I'm with you there. Uh, but I do. I, I think Brady cannot drop back and throw the ball 55 times. Yeah. And, and but are they going to be able to run the ball? Uh, if, if they don't have a healthy offensive line either. I mean, so much of that is Tristan Wirf's ability to pull across the formation and kick some people out. I, I tell you, a guy on the Rams team that impressed me that that I didn't know, I didn't know he was this kind of player, but Greg Gaines, their nose tackle, number 91, is a much better pass rusher. He looks like he has been living in Aaron Donald's house as far as learning techniques with his hands. I mean, his hand quickness and fighting, all the stuff that Aaron Donald, I had Aaron Donald one day, I go, forget, I don't wanna ask you questions. I want you to show me hand fighting. I want you, so he tried to break both my arms and I finally gave up and I go, let's forget about it. And, and but this Greg Gaines watching him now, he's getting after the quarterback. They're setting up, there was a play the other day in the Cardinal game, Leonard Floyd came down and took out the guy that was on Greg Gaines to set up his pass rush. I go, who does that for a nose tackle? But he got pretty consistent pressure inside as well. So um, I, I, I just think this is a fantastic matchup. Uh, and and the, the Rams, if they can have a day on offense, they don't have to be perfect, but they can't be terrible, right? They can't have, they can't lay one of those eggs uh, out there, but Odell Beckham Jr. right now is starting to look like Odell Beckham Jr. He just is. I mean, he got a one-on-one -on -one for a fade in the touchdown uh, in that game the other day, and he was looking around like, what? You guys are singling me out here and you're doubling Cooper Cup in there? Thank you very much for this layup. He went up and got it, and bango. And then all of a sudden, it was Cooper Cup in the second half that started being able to make some plays. So uh, very, very, very interesting game. I, I think this one, everybody's looking at Wirfs and Jensen, and I agree that that's a big deal. Um, the Rams last week, I got the impression that they were not necessarily hiding Matthew Stafford, but they certainly were trying to have a more balanced attack, running the ball and, and making the throws less risky for Stafford in that game. Andrew Whitworth is injured, right? Like there's a chance he doesn't play. I think a lot of people look at Wirfs and Jensen. They're not necessarily looking at the Whitworth. What could happen if no Joseph Nopum has to play left tackle for the Rams? Um, obviously, you know, the back to the Super Bowl last year, you know, you know, when Pierre Paul, Shoinenka, and uh 
uh, Shaq Barrett smell water in the you know blood in the water. They're a pretty good front. And, and you know, I don't necessarily know if you know if you can give like the thirty something carries to Michelle and Cam Akers when Vita Vey is eating up the middle of the field. So that that would be one thing I'm concerned about. I think the times where McVay's offense has struggled during his tenure, it's been few and far between, but it's when it's been when the offensive line is not what they want it to be. And without Whitworth, their best player there, like that, I think opens a door for Tampa Bay. And I think when you look at, you know, 48 and a half being the total in this game, the wind, much like last week, the wind projection for this game has gone up. I, I think under is a good bet in this game. Weirdly, even though you're looking at two really good offenses, I, I think under is a decent strategy because both teams, I think, are going to want to protect their offense a little bit by running the football. And I don't necessarily know if either team is going to be successful. If any team's going to be successful running, it's probably going to be the Bucs because the Rams use the least number of players in the box on early downs. Yeah, the Bucs are going to have to be successful running the football. But the same is true of the Rams. And uh, you, you watch enough of the Buccaneers play run defense, and they really just got the band back together last week. And I didn't think they looked great rushing the passer. I, I just didn't think they – Shaq Barrett and JPP and even Vita Vey, You know, I, I didn't think they looked – but I, they probably needed a game. You know, in horse racing, they say that – that horse needed that race to get back to that's what I thought they they kind of needed that game to get back in, into action but as far as setting an edge against an outside zone I, I'll take JPP and Shaq Barrett all day long I mean those guys and then you want to deal inside with Golston and Sue and Vea and you know it, it it's tough uh, but if you can't run it at all now you've got a problem because so much of the Rams pass protection is based on they can run outside zones. They can get your defensive line running sideways and have Stafford bootleg back out of there or half bootleg back out of there and have time to throw the ball down the field. Uh, and if he can't do that uh, because they're not running the ball and they've got to go to a drop back game, I I would be worried about this Rams group holding up against the Bucks. Yeah, and I think we saw yeah, that so in the Cardinals they, there's so many too. They, they, oh, they, they went back to kind of that, that under center play action, Sean McVay offense that we're more used to. You know, the storyline all year had been how they were more of it, you know, more shotgun, more drop back. And I agree with you. I think that is necessary to to keep this Buccaneers defense moving sideline to sideline, obviously, with um, you know, with Devin White and um, you know, Levante David at linebacker as well, also getting healthy. You know, I, I agree with you 100%. The, the, they need that run game to, to set up some of their play action work because they cannot get stuck and just drop back passing against this defense. Totally agree. I'm not going to pick this one because I'm going to have to call it. Who do you guys like in this one? Uh, if the, the numbers, if you look at Pinnacle Sports, for example, the Bucks are minus three plus 109, which means it's just a matter of time before this thing's going to get to two and a half. Um, if you give me Brady laying less than a field goal at home in a playoff game, um, I, you know, I, I, it's probably like my religion to bet that I think, uh, in some way. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I think stat, like I have a respect for the Rams and I, and I certainly think that they can come in and, and beat them, but I think we've overreacted a little bit too much to the season. Like in week three, everybody goes back to the week three game. The bucks were one and a half point favorites on the road in that game. And, and we turn, you know, 20 weeks into the future or so. And now the Bucks who are now at home are only favored by a point more, you know, to me, I, I think that that's a little bit off. And, and I think people are buying in a little bit too much to some of these teams. And we'll talk about Buffalo in a second. Some of these teams that blew their opponents out this week, I think some people are gravitating way too much to the, the results from the wild card round. And I think this is one of those instances on the market. Yeah, I'm with you, Eric, especially because, I mean, the Bucks blew the Eagles out as well, but I think the final score didn't exactly illustrate that because they kind of had some garbage time for Philly. So I'm with you there. I think it's too short if it's under a field goal, uh, but I think it's going to be a phenomenal game, and I wouldn't be surprised if either team wins. Philly can't throw the ball at all, though, and Matthew Stafford is going to be able to do it. I, I, I'm really curious to see if this offense takes the next step throwing the ball uh, with Odell. I mean, he's obviously only been there a few months, so or a couple of months. So it's going to be interesting to see how much he can do. Uh, or does the defense now have to shift over? And remember, in that game the other day, 
the Bucs only played two cornerbacks in the game. I mean, they only have Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis playing right now. Three safety look, a lot of stuff with Antoine Winfield having to play man coverage in the slot, a lot of zone blitz kind of thing. So uh, it, they're having to get a little creative on that side of the ball over there as well. Can the passing game of the Rams take advantage of some of that stuff? I, I love the game. I, I love the game. I'm, I'm thrilled we got this one. Plus, it's probably going to be about 70 degrees instead of whatever it was going to be in Green Bay up there. So God bless <laughs> Fox. I, I wish them well doing that. But that's a <laughs> those are rough days in Green Bay. So uh, let, let's go on here. And I know you guys have a few nuggets along the way, but Bengals Titans. I mean, for the first time now, this is the first game we're going to talk about where the number one seed comes into play. Uh, and Derrick Henry might come into play here as well. Uh, what are you anticipating from him? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, this is a weird one, right? Because everybody is saying, you know, the Titans are the worst number one seed we've ever seen. And like, you know, and I think a lot of that is baked into this idea of, you know, the last, you know, half of the season where, you know, they didn't have their full complement of players. Uh, we do make Tennessee the, the seventh best team in the NFL. We make them 3.6 points better than the average team on a neutral field, which is like, you know, the six teams ahead of them are all playoff teams. And then we have the Bengals as the 10th best team in the NFL, three points better than the average team on a neutral. So this is a pretty evenly matched team. And so like the point spread, you're basically arguing that home field advantage in Tennessee is plus the buy is worth about three points. That's what people, that's, that's the kind of thing that you're saying, which I would say if it was Lambeau field and the other team was San Francisco, that makes sense. I think Nashville, which, you know, as everybody knows, like it's just like about a four hour drive here from Cincinnati, people are going to be coming to, you know, from Cincinnati to that game. Tennessee's not a greatest home field advantage anyway. And, but at the same time, I think the bye week is very meaningful for Tennessee getting, you know, Derrick Henry back, getting Julio and AJ Brown with time off. Um, this is a very interesting one uh, at three and a half points on the point spread. I just have a remarkably hard time doubting Joe Burrow at this point the guy is absolutely everything you want in a quarterback and um and, and you know I, I I I I'm really excited we get to see it continue this weekend so I'll, I'll go against you on this one I, I think we saw why the buy was so important um not just for the rest but also you know I think the Bengals a pretty big loss for them is Larry Ogunjobi their nose tackle obviously against you know Derrick Henry is going to be toting the rock 25 plus times that's going to be a big loss and I think, yeah, all the guys getting back healthy for Tennessee, we kind of have a different perception of them after they had that, what, five-game win streak, beating basically the entire AFC playoff slate, and then, you know, struggled to close out the year with injuries. So, you know, I think Ogunjobi's a big loss for them. Obviously, Trey Hendrickson has a concussion. He did practice this week, but coming off the concussion, it's a bad matchup in a lot of ways for both teams, though. The Titans gave up the second most yards in the NFL to wide receivers. And obviously we could spend a whole podcast talking about the Bengals wide receiver group. So, you know, I think it's going to be a fascinating matchup and, and I think getting an early lead, and I know this is kind of an obvious thing to say, but getting an early lead in this game, I think will go a long way. I mean, I, I, it's amazing that the Cincinnati Bengals are, I feel like are the team that I understand the least. You know, I, I've I've seen them a couple of times. I jumped on board, and and I remember we were going to do them and flex into one of their games on Sunday Night Football. If and all I had to do was beat the Jets, and they got killed by the Jets. And I'm like, what? You know? And and then you go, eh, this is where it's going to happen. They have to go into Baltimore, a big game, you know, and, and they blow them out. Uh, and now they got to go to play Pittsburgh. Yeah, maybe at home, but. We know what's going to happen here. And they kill them, right? And so, and then the most stunning of all was to fall behind by 14 to Kansas City a couple of times in that game and come back twice and, and knock those guys out of the number one seed in a game that obviously meant a ton to them uh, for the for the season. So um, there's something about not knowing any better. You know, I in my, in my rookie year, we played in 81. We had the number one seed. We beat, we won the first game at home. We won the second game at home. We were playing in the Super Bowl. It's like, what? I mean, it didn't even feel like that big a deal. We won two home games and they're like, okay, whatever. 
And it's, and I kind of have that same feeling about Joe Burrow and T Higgins and Jamar Chase and Joe Mixon. And it just feels like they don't know any better. They're like, well, why wouldn't we win? We, we, uh, it's like the old quote with Jack Nicholas when the first time they ever asked him, like, how do you think you'll do on the senior tour? And he said, well, I've been beating these guys my whole life. I don't know why I wouldn't beat them now. And I think, I think that Joe Burrow feels the same way. Like well, I beat them in college. It's just, they're the same guys. Why wouldn't I be beating them now? Um, it's an interesting team. I, 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 I do not underestimate that anything is possible with this bunch, including winning a Super Bowl championship. Yeah, and you look at uh, Tennessee Titans uh, are one of the five worst teams in the NFL in terms of contesting targets. Um, one of the that's one of the things we chart. And you know, as you know, Chris, playing wide receiver, like you know, contested catch, you know, ability is pretty random, right? It, it's it's you know, it, it when guys can get open that that takes a lot of the variance out of a game and Tennessee doesn't do a great job of avoiding letting the other team get open and the Bengals have four players you know I count Uzama in that group as well but they have four players who get open pretty well and and you know Burrow does a great job of of you know going underneath and I, I think early on in the season the Titans are doing great because you know, guys like Jeffrey Simmons and, uh, you know, Harold Landry were emerging, but you look at the season long stats and their pass rush stats are, you know, in the twenties, no matter how you look at it. Um, last week's, you know, the Raiders, you know, Max Crosby made our all pro team a hundred pressures and, and Burrow was, you know, mostly fine in that game protection wise. So I, I don't think the Bengals are going to have a hard time scoring. I took uh, one of the bets that I made was Bengals over 21 and a half points. Um, because I, I think our models like the over in that game and, you know, maybe Tennessee, you know, is explosive offensively. Um, but I, I think no matter what happens in this game, I think Cincinnati is going to be able to score. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that'll make for a fun Saturday afternoon game. I, I agree. I, 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 game. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I, I don't think either team's going to stop either team. That, that's really the way I look at it. Go ahead, Brad. I was just going to say, I think, I think mentioning the Chiefs game is important, too, because the Titans play a lot of press coverage, and, and Jack Rabbit Jenkins missed some practice this week as well. So, um, you know, they, they could have the same issues, you know, with those late comebacks that, that Cincinnati was able to pull off against Kansas City. Uh, but I do think Jeffrey Simmons, this Bengals interior offensive line, I know we talked about the tackles all offseason. The interior of their offensive line is, is the issue. It's the 26th ranked interior offensive line per our grading that includes centers and guards and I think if Jeffrey Simmons has a big game he could cause a lot of problems no doubt about it I, I'll let you guys uh, go first here who do you like uh, so Brad and I are against each other I like the Bengals uh getting the three and a half points uh I certainly I certainly agree with Brad that if if Tennessee gets ahead this could be ugly um but I mean, we've watched it and I can't remember who it was, who I was talking to, but we've watched Burrow. Like Burrow is just not a guy that gives up that much. Right. I even think if this game gets extended, the you know Titans have a 10 point lead or something and you bet Cincinnati plus three and a half, you're always live because I think Burrow could drive the length of the field and score that backdoor touchdown. So um, I'll take the Bengals plus three and a half. I would not be surprised at all if they won. I got Titans uh, minus three before before they added the hook. So, you know, I, I feel better about it now that it's moved in my direction, but I'm with you. I, I think this game could go either way. Here's my concern. I, I think that at the end of the game, the Bengals are going to have to win the game on offense. Um, you know, and, and we saw it in the San Francisco game. We saw it in the game last week at the end of the game, you know, so they – run it, eat up the timeouts and punt the football. And now they got to defend on the 10 yard line and a chance to, to lose the game. I, I think you have to be realistic if you're in the Cincinnati organization. All of the best things that you do are on the offensive side right now, especially with the injuries now on the defensive side. Your likelihood of holding up at the end of the game defensively if they can just pound you and you know do their thing with their receivers and all that in Tennessee that uh, is is not going to be very high so at the end of the game go ahead and win it on offense you know <laughs> what difference does it make if you gave the Raiders the ball back with two minutes to go or three and a half minutes to go it didn't make any difference at all they were going to get one more shot with four downs on every down you know to go down the field and they almost did um, and San Francisco did do it so why not go, hey, Joe, 
Here you go, dude. It's yours. We're either going to win it or lose it based on how, if you can run out this clock here. I don't care how you do it. Drop back, throw bombs. Doesn't make any difference to me. But I'm putting the ball in your hand. We're winning this thing on offense, not on the defensive side of the ball. Well, and, and that's the thing I, you know, we were, uh, we were at the game. We, Desmond Trufant was lined up against Jamar Chase. And I'm like, if you complete a back shoulder to Chase, this game's over, right? 235 gets to the two minute warning. You can kneel. That's what the two minute warning's for. You can kneel every play if the other team doesn't have any timeouts after the two minute warning. And I, I always wonder, you know, for, you know, somebody who's, uh, you know, sort of played the game before as a wide receiver, like you want the ball in that situation, don't you? If you're Chase. You're dying to get the ball. I mean, you, your whole life, you're begging to get something one-on-one. -on -one. And when you've got arguably the best receiver in football, now, I, obviously, I understand that. He's a top five or six receiver in football right now. And you get him one-on-one, -on -one, it's like throwing the ball to Odell Beckham. Of course you're going to do that. Just throw it to him. You may lose. You may throw an interception. But I'd rather take my chances on winning the game in that moment with that combination because the defense, you know what they're going to do when you drop back and you you they know you're about to throw it? They're going to go, oh, crap. They are going to do this, right? They're betting every nickel they've got that, that they're going to put it up there and they're going to stop a run because they think that you're going to be conservative and you're going to run the ball and take our last time out away from us or whatever the case may be. Uh, it, it's just like when they go bump and run or cover zero and you throw a deep ball, the defensive coordinator stops breathing. They stop mm -hmm. breathing. You're like, oh, my God, they're going deep against our cover zero. Even if you don't hit it, they stop breathing. So I, I think that you gotta you got to hit these guys and everybody on defense with what makes them stop breathing. And in this game, that's really easy to figure out what makes them stop breathing. Joe Burrow throwing the ball out there to the outside of these receivers. And you just got to live and die with it. If you lose, you lose. That's the way I would be. If I lose, I lose. I'm losing with my strength. So yeah, two guys probably worth mentioning before we move on are back to back number one rated safeties in the last two seasons. I thought Jesse Bates was the best player on the field in the Bengals first matchup. And obviously Kevin Byard was our number one safety this year. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about these big mismatches on the outside. I think those guys could could make you know an interception or an impact play that could change this game. All right, let's go on to the Green Bay Packers and 49ers because this one uh, has some real interesting component parts to it here. Uh, obviously, a week off for the Packers. 49ers come in here. They'll be dealing with injuries starting at the top with Jimmy Garoppolo, shoulder, thumb, all that kind of stuff. He said, which one hurts worse? And he said, yes. So he's he's dealing with a few things. But we're also going to see the first time an experiment, I think, in many ways. Uh, the Green Bay Packers played David Bakhtiari a little bit in their last game as a tune-up. Uh, but apparently Zadaria Smith has a chance. Apparently Jair Alexander has a chance. So we're kind of getting the first of these NBA kind of looks going in this one where, okay, the regular season really didn't matter because we play in the NFC North and we got that covered. And so, but now that the, the real season has started in the playoffs, we're going to play all our guys. And here we go. I mean, it's possible that the best team in the NFC – just got a lot better if these guys are really right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was weird because you saw this number open um, with the, the San Francisco 49ers, only four and a half point underdogs, which I, I think if you, you know, sort of add up home field advantage, the buy, uh, the fact that the Niners are in a warm climate and they go to Green Bay, that adds a little bit to home field advantage in the playoffs, especially that would imply that the market only thought Green Bay was like a point and a half better than San Fran on a neutral field, which to me seems egregious. I think this Packers team, especially at full strength, is a lot better uh, than that. And, um, you know, now you see it at six. I think that's a much more reflective situation. Um, the other thing, and, and Chris, you know this, uh, you talked about the 81 playoffs. I mean, you played in the, I think, the coldest game other than the Ice Bowl in the history of the NFL. No, it was um, the coldest game because the wind was blowing 35 miles an hour. The ice bowl was like three or four degrees colder, but they didn't have that kind of wind. So just just trust me on this one. As a Florida I'm, I'm, boy, okay. in my first year out of the University yeah. of Florida, that was the coldest day in the history of Earth. It was the ice age. 
Yeah, and I think when you look at Garoppolo's thumb, you know, he's had the thumb injury for a couple weeks. It's a lot easier to manage that if you're a, uh, you know, you're in a dome and they were in a, you know, an indoor stadium in LA in week 18. They were in an indoor stadium in Dallas in week, you know, 19. Uh, this, you know, the only person that's been effectively able to throw with a bad thumb at Lambeau is Brett Favre. Um, and I think Garoppolo is not in that level that, and you add a shoulder injury to that as well. So, you know, I think the Niners are really going to probably have to focus on the run game this year or in this game. And, you know, uh, Elijah Mitchell has been pretty good this year, uh, 7.4 yards per carry on perfectly blocked runs, uh, which is, which is one of the better marks in football, but there weren't even that many perfectly blocked runs last week against Dallas. In fact, Mitchell's one of the least efficient runners on plays that aren't perfectly blocked, just 2.97 yards per attempt. Um, you know, uh, so I think that, you know, Green Bay has gotten the reputation for being soft and they've played softer down the stretch as a run defense. Um, but I think with a week off and really knowing that Garoppolo can't do as much as he wants to do, uh, I think the, I think the Niners run game is going to be less effective uh, than, than people, than they have been all season and what people believe. Yeah, I think also a big advantage for the Green, Green Bay is you look at the last NFC Championship game. I mean, Devondre Campbell is so much better than the off-ball linebackers that Green Bay had out there. And, and obviously this wide zone offense from San Francisco puts a ton of stress on those guys. Um, you know, a lot of high-low concepts, all the play action, everything just puts those guys in conflict. And on the other side, Fred Warner also not 100% healthy. You know, he's the highest paid off-ball linebacker in the NFL for a reason. And if he can't be a full go, I, I think – you know, this Green Bay offense could, could carve them apart over the middle. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be a really interesting game. Philosophically, the 49ers are going to want to run the football. I mean, there's just no way that anything's coming out of this other than that. Uh, and, and that's going to be it, you know, I mean, with Garoppolo banged up. And I, I just don't see any scenario other than – answer this question for me can the san francisco 49ers run it at an elite level if they can they've got a great shot to win the game if they can't then i think the packers are in a great spot here yeah i mean i think that that's that's pretty plain i think the one thing about the 49ers and this is where i think if you're betting this game now um you probably should have got green bay at minus four and a half when it opened but if you're betting this game now i think there's so much variance in this game that I think the Packers either blow out the Niners. I think it like blow them out, you know, 30, you know, 21 points, 28 points, whatever, or the Niners win the game outright. Because I think the, the, the chance that this game stays close is pretty low to me just because Garoppolo, I, I said this yesterday in the PFF forecast with George Garoppolo says what's on the teleprompter. Right. And, and that that leads to, he doesn't check the ball down like some of the other guys who are in his caliber. He literally throws what's called. And that is why you see him throw more interceptions than other guys sort of in that tier. But it's also why you see him average second in the league in yards per attempt, because what is called by the Niners is a pretty good offense. And it's just a matter of like whether or not he's hitting those throws on a, on a game day as to whether or not the Niners win. And I think if he does, and I think there's a low chance he does, but if he does, I think the Niners can win. If he doesn't, I think this game's going to be a blow up. Interesting. All right, let's move on now because I do want to get to some of Brad's notes that he uh, wrote about this week. Uh, let, let's go on to the, the I don't know, probably the game that will be most discussed, I, I would think, at the end of this. And that's the Buffalo Bills against the Chiefs in a rematch. Uh, we did the first game. The Bills had a great day. Uh, they they ran Josh Allen quite a bit in that game. Um, there were some things written about <laughs> my comments in the game as well as far as doing, okay, you keep running your quarterback. Those guys sitting over on the bench for the Kansas City Chiefs are going, okay, how many times are you going to run this guy? And, and we're going to – you know, and then they had one where they twisted his ankle a little bit. I, I just kind of know how it goes. You know, those guys, it starts making them mad. But now everything's on the line. Um, and, you know, as far as who's the hottest team in football, you can argue, I guess, a couple of them. But right now, the Kansas City Chiefs, um, especially coming off of that that game against um, 
um, where they were really able to sort of piece the whole thing together uh, after the Cincinnati loss. I think the loss kind of maybe did them some good in some weird way. But how do you talk about anybody other than the Buffalo Bills and the beatdown they put on New England? I, I, I mean, if you go seven straight touchdown drives against anybody, that's unbelievable, unprecedented in the playoffs. You do it against Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots, that's off the charts. Yeah, I think it's it's unbelievable like how well they played, especially in a year for Buffalo that's been really uneven, right? I mean, uh, you know, two weeks ago, because you know, the two weeks ago in wet in weather conditions, they were down to the Atlanta Falcons at home uh, at, at halftime, uh, and then the following week they were only ahead by three against the Jets in the fourth quarter, I believe. Of that game, maybe it was like late in the third, but they were really grinding out games that maybe there was, you know, if you want to be pro Bills in this situation, you could say that they were just not interested in, right? And then, you know, they in an NBA sense, they get into this playoffs against a team. That, that, that's beat up on them for two decades uh, and they, they lay the smack down. Well, this is another team in Kansas city uh, that has been, you know, what they're trying to emulate, right. With, with Josh Allen and, and with the defense that plays the too high stuff. Um, you know, I think the motivation will be there for Buffalo. Uh, Kansas city was a little slow to go uh, in your game uh, last week. Um, but then they scored five touchdowns in 10 minutes of football, uh, which is crazy to think about. Um, and, and so you get two really hot teams, unlike the LA versus, uh, Tampa Bay game. I don't think that there's a whole lot of like permutations to what's going to happen. I think it's basically Buffalo is going to throw Josh Allen at you and the chiefs are going to throw Patrick Mahomes at you and whoever, you know, ends up playing better is going to win. I think that that's the, um, you know, that's basically the name of the game here. So it's basically pick your quarterback, I think. Yeah, I went back and watched the tape of this game this morning, and one thing that jumped out to me, you mentioned Chris, is, is they were running out of a lot, uh, and I thought it was interesting, right out of the offset, the first series of the game, he had a big design run, he gained about 20 yards, they were running pre-snap motion on almost every single snap, just trying to, you know, I know Steve Spagnuolo for Kansas City plays a lot of man coverage, but they, I think they were trying to get this Chiefs defensive line just moving laterally, tire them out a little bit, so they couldn't just tee off, and then something Eric's talked about a bunch, but I thought was interesting, the Chiefs ran 30 more plays than the Bills in that first matchup. And so, you know, maybe did Andy Reid show his hand a little bit more than the Bills had to? Obviously, the game was a long time ago now. But um, I think the last point, though, the Buffalo Bills draft this year was because of, the, of this AFC championship last year. They took edge rushers with their first two picks because in that game last year, they could not generate a, a, press, a pass rush with just four down linemen. As we all know, you're not supposed to blitz Patrick Mahomes, so you have to do that. And I still, I'm still, i still not sure I'm, I'm a believer that this Bills pass rush with four guys can get home. The other part of it is, what does Tredavious White's absence mean in this game? You know, because you got somebody that would have a chance against Tyreek Hill, McCole Hardman, right? Pringle, those guys. Uh, and, and what exactly is the matchup on Kelsey here? I, you know, is it, is it one of these safeties? Is it, you know, Tremaine Edmonds? I, you know, what, what exactly how it, it's, when you talk to coaches, they all talk about the same thing. You know, it, it's, it's about the matchups. When you get into playoff time, it's sort of like divisional football. You know each other, you know exactly what they're going to do but who can do the job? And, and to me, the glaring weakness right now is who on Buffalo is going to take Tyreek Hill. Um, and and I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. And um, the other one that, that stuck out to me on Kansas City was I think Jarek McKinnon at running back adds something to this team. Um, he, he is fast. He is dangerous in the open field. Uh, he's sort of what I thought Clyde Edwards Alaire would be. Of course, I don't know what his issue is now with the shoulder, whether he'll be back to play or not. Um, and and then uh, on their offensive line, does Andrew Wiley hold up at the right tackle position throughout the playoffs? You know, that's they're going to have to help. They're going to have to do some things. Um, I mean, T.J. Watt got him plenty of times in the game the other night, but it wasn't a, a total train wreck. I've seen train wrecks, uh, you know, when the third tackle plays in a game. Uh, it, it was not a train wreck. So uh, it, there's just there's a million different interesting things. But 
if the Bills stumble and get beat, I, I tend to think I'm going to be talking about Tredavious White at the end of this one. Yeah, the, the interesting statistic there is the Kansas City Chiefs uh, this season are the only team in the NFL with t- less than 10% of their targets contested by the other team. Um, you know, so they're a team that gets open. Um, and I think throughout much of the year, uh, Mahomes, you know, having issues with accuracy was one of the reasons their offense wasn't doing great. I think he's, you know, curbed that a little bit. Buffalo is a top five team in the NFL in terms of contesting the opponent's uh, uh, targets. About 18.5% of their opponent's uh, targets are contested by them. Less than 10% of the Chiefs' targets are contested by opponents. But the, your point about McKinnon's well taken. McKinnon has five runs this year of over 10 yards on 24 carries. He's 24 carries all year, Ten, five of them over 10 yards. Clyde Edwards Lair at nine and over 100 and, and about 120 carries. So, what the Chiefs were missing in the run game was just that explosive element that they even had with Damian Williams in the past, that they had obviously with Kareem Hunt there. And Edwards Hilaire has been a solid running back for them, but not an explosive one. And I think the Chiefs, when they got McKinnon in the lineup Sunday, um, that component of their run game where they could pick up big chunks of yardage uh, through the screen game or through running the football was something that was, I think, has been sorely missed from their offense for over a year now. Yeah, it's it's um, <clears throat> it's going to be really interesting. And I think that um, a, a couple of these young linebackers are going to play a key role. Uh, Willie Gay is athletic guy who can move, who could catch Josh Allen on the move. Nick Bolton is a guy who can play in space, and they're taking over a bigger and bigger role uh, on the defensive side of this thing as well. Um, but <clears throat> it's still hard to cover this bunch, you know, and you play Kansas city, you're going to get some man coverage. You're going to get opportunities and Stefan Diggs is going to get one-on-one stuff. Cole Beasley is going to get one-on-one stuff. Emmanuel Sanders. I mean, you're talking about some of the best one-on-one route runners and Dawson Knox isn't bad either at tight end. So y- these are, these are legitimate offensive weapons. Uh, but if you had to say which of these two quarterbacks plays better on the move, there's no question it's Josh Allen. I mean, jo- Patrick Mahomes is a good runner. Uh, I would say in, in a legit runner of the football, Patrick Mahomes is more of a runner and a mover to get open to throw the football. So can Patrick do that and create some big plays in the game? If he does, then you love him. Uh, if not, it may be those eight runs that Josh Allen has in this game that moves the chains, that keeps things away from the Kansas City offense that could well decide it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a very – I've said this on a few shows. I think if Buffalo plays their best game and the Chiefs play their best game, I think Buffalo wins. I think if both teams play their average game, I think the Chiefs win. I, you know, I think, I think Allen – can compound so many great things um, with the, the weapons they have, which I think they have probably twice as many great weapons as the Chiefs do, even though the Chiefs weapons are, you know, the top end guys are a little bit better. Um, you know, so again, I think that's the thing. I think Allen can, you know, really lean into what a great defense gives them. But, you know, that that defense has a lot of potential, but they've also had some duds this year. So, um, like I said, I think the Chiefs on average are better, but I think the Bills their ceiling's a little higher than Kansas City's. Do I even have to ask your pick? You're taking your Chiefs, right? I ha- I mean, I have to. I, I, <laughs> I actually think under is a fairly good play in this game too, weirdly. As much as we've talked about these offenses, I think both defenses are going to try to play cover two and tackle. Um, and I think most touchdown drives on Sunday are going to be 10 plays or more. I, uh, the, the point you had earlier about Tom Brady catching less than a field goal at home in the playoffs, just becoming an auto bet it is why I like the Chiefs in this one as well. Uh, I know we've been talking a ton about matchups. I think another matchup that could be huge is because those safeties for the Bills maybe need to bracket or, or keep an eye on Tyreek Hill, can Matt Milano take on Travis Kelsey over the middle? Obviously, you can't stop Travis Kelsey, but can you contain him to a degree? I mean, that's why they re-signed Milano this offseason, and I think that could dictate a, a big part of this game. Unbelievable. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come right back. Brad, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you were talking about this week and and your great article and the free agents and uh, the various things to come. We'll be right back in one second. All right, let's get back. And before we get out of here today, just hit quickly on some of these uh, coaching topics. And uh, Brad, I I know that 
Uh, there's some interesting things going on with the head coach of the Michigan Wolverines, Jim Harbaugh, great success in the NFL, uh, got beaten the Super Bowl by his brother. But other than that, his record in four years with the 49ers was 44, 19 and one. I mean, that kind of speaks for itself. Is there a little demand for him out there? Yeah, I think a couple teams could be in the mix here. Obviously, you've heard the last couple of days about the Las Vegas Raiders. They love to make a big splash with their head coach hiring. They obviously just fired GM Mike Mayock, and Rich Passaccia is interviewing for that gig. But Harbaugh got a start in Las Vegas, and, and there's a lot of indications he may return. But I also think we should keep an eye on the Chicago Bears here. Um, you know, I, I think Harbaugh has an interest in, in going back to where he played back in the day. Um, and, and I think we should not just write it off that the, that the Raiders are the only team in the hunt here. Oh, I, I think there are a lot of teams that are not going to show their hands, but probably do have a little interest. Now, um, it is interesting you bring up Mike Mayock and and Eric. It, it's it's always a little weird to me, right? And because I don't know, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. But Mike Mayock is going to get fired. It did get fired from a job, and we don't know if he ever made a pick. You know, I mean, we have no idea. Was John the one making the picks? Was it some collaboration? I'm sure it was. But how much do you think we actually learned about Mike Mayock as a GM? Yeah, I mean, I think it's and, and this is important to consider this time of year in general, right? Because we're all looking at these candidates who, you know, were were assistants to GMs and, and assist, you know, scouting people for all these teams. And I think attribution is one of the hardest problems in football, right? Like how much do you attribute, you know, somebody who was the, you know, a, a player personnel director for the chiefs, like how much of that roster is dependent upon this person's decisions and so on. And I think Mayock is it, even being a general manager, right. Shows how hard that is. Right. Because I think that the, um, I think that the official statement was that John Gruden had 51% of the control and Mayock had 49. Um, but ultimately, once you get over that 50%, how much control do you really have? And, and that Raiders team, I mean, when Gruden took over, that was a four and 12 team or, or when Mayock took over, that was a four and 12 team. And now it's a 10 and 17. And they were eight and eight last year. They were seven and nine the year before. There's gradual growth there, despite the fact that the draft picks, especially in the, in the early rounds, were almost all duds. So then the question becomes like, you know, how much of that was Gruden's coaching? How much of that was luck? How much of that was Mayock finding free agents that ended up being good? Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the Raiders thing, uh, you know, to me adds, and you, you got to see them in week 18, the Raiders thing just adds so much complexity to, uh, you know, are they a team that, you know, a guy like John Harbaugh could just, or Jim Harbaugh, sorry, could go right into and have success right away with? Like, is that a ready-made team or... Or was Gruden and company, you know, squeezing every list, last bit of juice out of the orange for that for that squad? Yeah, there, there are so many, <clears throat> all these offensive and defensive coordinators. Um, it, it just, oh, I, I don't know how you pick and choose. And then you've got the the uh, the issue of only one black head coach in the league right now that is just painful for the NFL. I know that it is, um, you know, that you have to begin hiring, uh, you know, some of the guys that, that are deserving Eric Bieniemy. I mean, it's almost unbelievable that he's been able to survive <laughs> this long and, and not do it, but it, it's, for me, it's going to be so hard. I'm going to go through, you know, Byron Leftwich and Raheem Morris, this game. And, and Todd Bowles and uh, you know, it's just gonna, you're just gonna, there's a never ending list, Kevin O'Connell of different guys that are deserving, but it's one owner picking one guy and mm -hmm. there's no controlling that there never will be any controlling that. But when the cumulative effect of it is you have one uh, black coach in the NFL, then that's, that's pretty damning. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of these things you do have to at some point step in. Like almost all progress requires some sort of intervention at some point. Um, and, and and yeah, I mean, I don't know what the right number is. I don't know what the right like you know a lot of the stuff we've tried as a league have not worked. And that doesn't mean that you know the 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 goal is is futile. 
Um, but yeah, it, it is damning to see that. And it, and it, you know, it, again, like it, the thing about all of these things is any one instance can be explained away. Like, Oh, why was Brian Flores fired? Well, he, he didn't get along with, with Greer. Okay. Well, that makes sense. But then like, it's the cumulative effect of these things. Um, as you said, that, that are, that are an issue. And obviously, um, you know, Eric Bieniemy. I even think Eric Bieniemy's particular instance can be explained uh, by a few things. You know, for example, the Chiefs are almost never out of it in the middle of January where all these guys are getting hired and so on. But again, like when you add it all up, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so something I think needs to be done there. But, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting. I like, it's, like you said, all those names that you said have made a really big impact. Uh, Todd Bowles' game plan in the Super Bowl, for example, last year. Uh, is a masterpiece, and um, and you should land him a head coaching job somewhere. Leslie Frazier, Brian Dable. I mean, there are a million guys on uh, the assistant coaches list that are going to come up. Uh, and then I, I think the one that we have to close with is Mike McCarthy. Does anything change in Dallas after the, uh, the quarterback draw? Brad, do you, do you have any – I mean – we were we were talking about the the possibility of him getting let go at, it, with a loss in that game, and it, it feels like there was no worse loss than they could have had. It seems like he's going to be able to keep his job at least for another year. Yeah, there were some reports. There was even one official report from Jason Luckenfora that came out that he was potentially on the hot seat. It does seem like he's safe, but I think it'll be an interesting dynamic. It, it sounds like there is some buzz about Mike Zimmer, who obviously was with the Cowboys for a long time before going to the Bengals and then the Vikings. Um, if he returns as defensive coordinator, not to, you know, like, like who is the alpha in that building? If it's Mike McCarthy and Mike Zimmer, both on the coaching staff. Um, and, and there were reports that if Zimmer got fired by the Vikings the year prior, he may have actually gotten that job over Mike McCarthy in the first place. So uh, I think Dallas is definitely still in a, a state of flux. Uh, I think it seems like he's safe for now, but next year is going to be huge in Dallas because they're losing a lot of talent. I mean, we talk about our free agent list. I mean, Dalton Schultz and you go to, you know, Michael Gallup, you go down the list, Randy Gregory was phenomenal this year. I mean, it's going to be hard for them to be as good as they were this year and coaching gaffes kind of knocked them out of the playoffs. Uh, it was, it was rough to watch And <clears throat> Obviously there's a million different ways to win and lose football games. Even if they get the time out, they're not assured of, of that possibility. I, Eric, I was going to ask you, but just the math alone, does the math favor gaining 20 yards <clears throat> regardless of how you do it and taking one shot as opposed to two Hail Marys from the 40? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing when you look at the <clears throat> essentially like the, the mathy way to say it. And actually, I've been reading a lot about basketball this week, too. It's kind of interesting where we, we, we treat distance as I think a lot more of a variable than maybe it should be. I think the curve is a lot flatter. So if you throw it from the 41 and we were talking on the, uh, the live watch along, which by the way, you can watch for the Buffalo Kansas city game Sunday uh, on the PFF YouTube channel. And um, we were talking about, uh, you know, we were talking about it as it was happening. It's like, they're at the 41, there's 14 seconds left. You could, it's probably going to take seven or eight seconds to throw the ball into the end zone from the 35. And so you could have even taken one more shot to get to the 35 with like nine seconds left to assure you two shots. Because the issue is, you know, probabilistically, you almost always want to have two opportunities to do something than one, as long as the one opportunity isn't so much more probable than the, than the two that you're, you're going to try consecutively. And the difference between the 41 and the 24 was simply not worth all of the risks that they took to get that far. Um, because again, you only get that one shot. And so it, it was not a good move. And, and you know, I think um, it was kind of a, a, a misunderstanding of how the, the math works, but also um, and also a misunderstanding of how the league works, right? Like, and, and I think that this is a broader question about Dak Prescott too. Like I, I bring this up only because I want to, you know, Dak's making that 45 million, right? And we think about, you know, does is he the quarterback that can make that kind of money and you can win with? I'll tell you what, Tom Brady, that ball is getting spotted right away, right? I, you know, Patrick Mahomes, that ball is getting spotted right away. And, you know, to also not price in, and I, I use a swear word about this on the show, but I'm, I'm not going to, but it's not price in the nonsense that the NFL goes through just to do, just to do expected things is also part of the wrong calculus that they had, right? Like this idea that they could execute the slide, hand the ball to the rep, 
ref plot, you know, spots it, you all line up, you spike the ball. I, I you know, uh, to me, I thought that that was just a really misunderstanding of the probabilities associated with everything. I mean, even if Dak walks by, gets up, stands there, sees the umpire sprinting in there, and he was sprinting for God bless him for whatever he's worth. That was his top 40 time right there. Uh, tell your offensive lineman, get the hell out of the way, hand him the ball as he goes by. You're probably still going to be able to make it, but I bet you they never practiced how long because the umpire is no longer in the middle of the field. I mean, just that rule change along impacts how you're going to run that play because now the official is probably 15 yards behind that has to spot that ball is flying up from the back end of that thing and having to get it and place it. And now you've got to stop the clock. It was just, um, it was, it was a little rough to watch. It was, it was rough to watch. So. Yeah. And, and I think that that is, you know, when, when I think about what are the errors that teams make in the NFL and I'll, I'll bring it, I'll bring it back to another thing. It's trading two entities for one, when they think that that one entity is way more likely to work. Right. And we see it in the draft, right? You trade two first round picks to move up 10 spots to take another guy. And I, and Brad, this is Brad's research. This is Brad's book, but like those two opportunities are way better collectively than the one you just traded up for. And I think the, 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 the Dallas Cowboys, did that with yardage right and and the curve uh, you know the math sense the curve is a lot flatter than that you know throwing a hail mary from the 35 it obviously is less likely to go in than from the 25 but not that much more yeah there i talked to an old horse trainer one time and i said i go look because we've always had one horse like almost all my buddies for most of our lives we put in a little bit of money and you know but there's a hundred of us that do it so, but it's fun. We've had a good time with it. So we decided one time we were going to spend $50,000 total on a horse. And he said, well, then you don't want one horse. You want two $25,000 yes. horses, right? That's exactly what he said. And the point being exactly that you want two swings to take a shot at it. And, and I, I just feel like that, that, I, I, I don't know. It, it was, it was frustrating to watch on so many different fronts uh, at the end of that game. And, and, uh, it's too bad because for all involved, it's going to be one they're going to have to live with forever. And, and we've all had them, you know, I've had them broadcasting too, with things you got to live with forever. And, um, you know, it's, it's too bad for the Dallas Cowboys and for Jerry Jones, who I know <clears throat> had to think that this was, he had a chance this year that they had a chance. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that, that roster was loaded. They, they definitely had a chance. I also think another thing that they don't maybe consider enough is the odds that you're getting a, a defensive pass interference call on maybe that first Hail Mary. There's just, I think there's other components that could have made it a, a more valuable and more likely, you know, positive outcome. No doubt. Gentlemen, it's been great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My voice is almost gone. I'm going to try and save a little for Sunday, uh, but it's going to be a great weekend. Enjoy.